So welcome guys. So I'm monitoring multiple chats at the same time. So if you have questions <laughs> during the uh, uh, the session, feel free to um, you know write them in the chat, and and Tim will be monitoring uh, this. So just before we start, um, uh, so Tim, uh, I need no introduction, but it's a principal data flow engineer at at, at Tadera. Uh, I'm a principal solution engineer at Cladera as well. My um, uh, domain of expertise is kind of the cloud deployments of uh, um, different tool sets. But for today, I took a um, um, page from the machine learning side for a personal project uh, that uh, I had in mind. <laughs> And I'm going to be leveraging some of the cool thing that you can do in the cloud and some streaming to be able to bring that to life. And the problematic here is identifying Magic the Gathering cards. So let me let me dive into this. First, um, you know what are Magic the Gathering cards? For those who don't know, like for, yeah, obviously I'm a massive nerd, but for those who don't know, um, this is. Um, a trading card game that was invented in uh, 1993 by uh, Richard Garfield, right? And it's an awesome game. It's, it's very fun, it's very deep. Uh, and um, it's, it's, you know, I, I just can't stop playing it. So one of the things that the, that the problem with those cards is you can see like I have a deck here, uh, a box, and those cards can be fairly valuable. So you have to like sleeve them and double sleeve them if you want to play with them. And so the shuffling itself is a pain. It's like, it's kind of like, if you, especially if you have small hands and you're not very, very good at this, uh, you, you, you're gonna spend some time shuffling it. And in any game of magic, uh, you have, you know, a lot of time where you need to look something into your deck, into the library, you need to find a, a way to get there. And it's like really painful. So a friend of mine and I got tired of it and said, you know, what if we build a shuffler machine, right? That will do that for you and kind of gives you the uh, um, the ability to feed a card whenever you need it. So there's a problematic of like building the feeder itself, which I didn't take uh, uh, didn't take charge of because my my buddy is doing it. But um, regardless of what we're doing, we need to be able to identify those cards as they go through the feeder to be able to know what, where they are and where, where they are in the in the, in the shuffler. So uh, there was, there's probably attempts of that. And, and you know, uh, Identify Card has been quite popular in like this, for instance, a TCG player app that allows you like to scan your collection for like sales or, or, or stuff like this. Um, there's spell table as well that, uh, you know, is, is used for, for EDH players, um, uh, you know, especially during COVID where you basically point a camera on top of your, table and it tells you which cards is on the table for, so that people can see it better. But for, for problematic for me, uh, I want to have something that runs uh, on the edge and uh, be, is able to identify card quickly, right? Um, and so I thought about different ways to, to approach this. And I'm going to dive, I'm going to double click on, on the one that I spent a little bit of time on, uh, but I will, you know, um, go over also the, the other stuff that I tried. So the um, the first thing that I tried was to use uh, OCR. So OCR uh, is so it's a character recognition. Uh, there's a uh, the Python library called Tesseract, um, and there's some example where you build a Tesseract dictionary for. Uh, Magic the Gathering. The problem with Magic the Gathering cards is that um, it, the, the the fonts and especially on the title, like it, it's you know it's very hard to see. Like, I don't know if you can see here, but the difference between this and like that, it's quite significant, right? And it, what what you end up doing is when you, when we try to to um, to identify this using uh, OCR, you know you can see sort of like the 
the type but the car name is just garbage right you can still you can sort of get this because it's on the on the white um on the on the white background but other than that it's like kind of hard so that just didn't work out so my next attempt is the one that i'm going to dive into is to use uh, transfer learning so transfer learning is a way to um retrain a, uh, a a neural net with a different set of images and this is something work that uh is based on what ian brooks that were in, in a previous session um had done to identify some of uh, our logo detection and so i decided to take um what Ian did and try to adapt it to um, to Magic the Gathering because I figured, you know, if I can identify at least the image, the art on the card would be a, a, a good way to be able to identify the card itself uh, rather than like trying to fi to do character recognition, right? Um, and I know that this worked on a on a on a edge device because it's just running a, um, a TensorFlow. Um, model also, and I had a I have a I had a dev board that uh, that is running a GPU, so I figured it would be a good idea. Um, in in terms of uh, um, overview, this is kind of what it looks like. I, by the way, I started training this on my computer, and uh, it was like super slow. So I figured I'm a cloud engineer, so why not use the cloud and spin up a couple of GPUs to train the model, right? And that's that. It's generally good practice. You, I've tried to run some, uh, you know, compile some stuff on my Raspberry Pi, and I may or may not have fried it. So I don't encourage you to do this. Um, so I ha I'm going to show you here. I have a, a machine learning. Um, you know, this is a cloud era machine learning. So it's basically deploying um, uh, a, a Kubernetes cluster on. Um, uh, on AKS, sorry, on EKS, on, on AWS, this is point. Basically going to tra train the model here. I mean, do data augmentation, train the model there. Then leveraging NIFI, I'm going to take this data uh, that is in an, that the, the model that I'm going to put in an S3 bucket and then push it back to my, um, to my Coral Dev CPU. And what's interesting here is that this is typically, the th this could be, obviously enhanced, but this kind of architecture is kind of what you're going to see at, at larger scale, right? Obviously, you wouldn't directly upload the, the model to one uh, TPU, right? This is where you would leverage technologies like um, EFM, right? Or the, the, so you have NIFI talking to multiple uh, um, Minify agents and like updating those flows. But um, this is, you know, something that works at scale, and you'll see that there's there's a couple of stuff that are interesting, and that takes care of all the security aspect of, of of this transfer. So, without further ado, um, let's have a look at what it looks like. So, I have my uh, Clara data platform here. I have, you know, different experience. I went into the machine learning aspect, and I have a, you know, basically a project, and it's running now. Uh, and this project is basically I, I imported it from my GitHub, and I'll give you the um, the link to the GitHub afterwards. But I just pulled it from the GitHub, and I currently have a session that is running. And what you notice is this session is actually running with uh, you with eight uh, vCPU, two GPUs, and it's actually using a custom image that I made uh, because I wanted to use you know I wanted to leverage those uh, those GPUs, and you know. Um, um, Ian used a, a TensorFlow 1.15 that required a, the CUDA library 10.0, so I had to build a custom image. But it's fairly easy; like it, you, you create a custom image and 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 you, you deploy it. So let's have a look a little bit about um, you know the, the the steps that you will have to to follow. I'm going to stop my training here, right? To uh, to generate this. So the first thing that you have to do is I have essentially, um, I, I run into um, 
you get to you need to get the images right you need to get the images from somewhere so i have here a couple of example images that i took that's a couple of uh, um pictures that i've taken of urza right so i have this picture taken like this i have a picture that is that is uh moved around a little bit and the first thing that's that i'm going to do here is you know obviously this is training for one card you could have a lot more I, I tried different methods. Um, I tried to download directly the uh, images from a, the Scryfall API, but they were very um, you know, polished and that didn't really work. So here, what I did is I did a bunch of different pictures and more importantly, the first thing that I'm doing before actually training the model, and, I, and, and by this, I mean like doing transfer learning, I actually do uh, data augmentation. So if you look at it, and I automated all this, right? But what I've done is I, I by leveraging a data uh, augmentation um, uh, library, basically from one picture, will generate a bunch of like, you know, pictures like this, where you're gonna have like, it's gonna be slightly uh, moving a little bit, changing a little bit the, the, um, uh, the luminosity and so on and so forth, so that, the um uh the 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 model has you know a lot more data because once you um i i, I went from essentially i think i took like five or ten ten different picture to like ten times that right so you end up having a, a lot more cards to um um uh to a lot more images to play with than uh, then you um, you would have normally. So this is a very important step because uh, it allows to, as you know, like the, the the those neural net will train better with a lot of data. So the first step really was to do this this data augmentation piece. Um, from there, I basically um, I I run a um, uh, I, I downloaded this uh, this SSD uh, pre-trained model that is here, right? And I do transfer le learning using those images uh, on uh, uh, fr from 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 this um, uh, from this model. So you can look at what it looks like here. Um, so this is what kind of like one of the cool things with um, cloud and machine learning is that you get the ability to um, uh, do uh, terminal access like this. And so I can run my thing, which is basically train a card for this particular the this particular card, and this will um, you know start the training at a specific checkpoint. So as the the thing is running, uh, you'll see that it will create a checkpoint for your model, right? And it will take the last one. So the last one is like ninety eight twenty five. And why is that important is that as you start uh, training this model, you can just take this checkpoint. And compile it into a model uh, that you're going to be able to um, to run, right? Um, and so what you'll see here, so it's starting the uh, the the training. What I uh, what I witnessed is that, as you can see in the uh, in the readme of the project, uh, when I'm running it on my uh, on my CPU, it'll take like two to four seconds to do one step. And what you notice here is once you're gonna start running it on GPU, right, leveraging the, um, um, the CUDA's libraries, you'll see that it runs at about, um, you know, 0 0.4 second per step. So obviously like, that allows you to, to, um, uh, to try to do a lot more training in a, a much shorter amount of time right and that's you know that's kind of the the beauty of these um uh uh this cloud machine learning is that you can basically run a, a GPU notebook and like just call out like hey i want a couple of gpus can you help me train my model so i'm going to wait for it to uh load but you know you'll see that soon enough well, I have an example here, right? You will see that once you start like um, humming, you're looking at like 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 seconds average to do this training, which is which is substantial if you know 
you don't want to have your computer running for 24 7 for like three days to run a small model uh once you've done this uh, there's a couple of scripts that you that i run to basically model the uh, to package the model like when i'm doing it on my uh, local computer i'm just directly um inserting it into my my cpu but uh what I've done here is I'm actually saving it into an S3 bucket. So this is still running, but I had this um, um, small um, this small Python code that basically takes one file and create it and puts it into an S3 bucket. So here is the like the interesting part and some of the things that can be a little bit tricky, um, but are not really when using a, uh, an integrated platform like ours. I am able to uh, basically get um, AWS temporary credential from the, uh, from the Cloudera ID broker um, uh, API. What does that mean? Essentially, you know, in, in Cloudera, you have this, this um, concept of, um, uh, in a, an SDX layer, and what that does, it it allows the translation from all of your different services to your cloud um, uh, to your cloud uh, assets. So typically here, I am only allowed to go to this particular bucket, that is the the PVIVs bucket, um, and just by um, and I have this service called ID Broker that is basically, that is actually part of the Nox um, Apache project, if you want to check it out. That allows you to do translation of um, uh, AWS and Azure credential and cloud credentials essentially uh, to a, um, from Kerberos to this, to this uh, uh, cloud credential. And that's like super important because here I'm, look, uh, I'm authenticated as myself as Paul uh, in um, in Kerberos because it's it's this is the way that uh, you know the the, the Hadoop ecosystem is using us for uh, uh, identification mostly, and I get to translate my identity as Kerberos to a, a temporary access token, which is which is huge, right? Because uh, you don't have to bypass this, and then I'm just doing a simple thing that says, hey, like using these temporary things, like upload a file from and like I'm uploading like this uh, this image so let's say I could go uh, home CDSW example card right and the card so actually so EMG uh, 0370.jpg um, and I'm gonna push it under uh, MTG vision uh, at, and this is going directly to my, uh, the root of my SDX, which is the PVIVs bucket, right? And so if I, I'm gonna stop the, uh, sorry, the, uh, the training. No need to use those. Um, I can run this. And so this will request my temporary uh, token and etc. And what you'll see is, you know, once once you get the um, the uh, the response from the the API, what you'll see is that eventually it will show up into uh, my MTG Vision folder. Now, the what you have to remember is that. Uh, uh, S3 is like eventually consistent. So it might take some time. Oh, but I may be actually reading this directly. What I'm doing afterwards from there is I'm using uh, NiFi. So I have a small cluster NiFi that is tied to the same environment. And what this thing does is if I go to, to the NiFi piece, uh, it's going to take the, um, it's gonna read this, this folder this, this S3 folder that I was talking about. The, and because I'm an idiot, I probably deleted the, yeah. Basically, NiFi takes the data directly from the bucket and like deletes it and then uh, deletes it uh, automatically. So I have a get HDFS um, processor. HDFS goes actually underneath to um, S3 using ID broker again. Like it does this exchange without uh, transparently. 
And what you'll see here is that as I start putting stuff in there, um, I'm going to see the um, the data that I just pushed from uh, from this. So here in this example, obviously, uh, I'm doing the uh, uh, I'm sending the the image itself, but this is where I would push my compiled uh, my compiled model, uh, and then I have something that just does a put ASFTP and I had to change the the port because my ISP doesn't like opening port 22 for some reason. I mean, I don't know why. <laughs> Who would think that would be a bad idea? Uh, but if I start this and start uh, refreshing it, uh, you'll see that um, it's going to start uploading. And now I can basically like connect to my um, to my. This is my uh, core TPU, and you'll see that. I uploaded the file. So that's got to give you the end to end, right? You training, you do data augmentation, you're training it, and then you're pushing it to your, um, to your, to your TPU, right? And then what you can do is once you have this, uh, you can run, uh, so obviously in my case, I, I had uh, uploaded this TensorFlow Lite uh, model, right? And I can start running it directly on my, um, on my um, uh, Coral TP. So uh, now I can connect to this thing, 10.0.0, blah, blah, blah. No, not 49, I think, you know, the HTTP, guys. All right, I have this running, okay? And then I can start running and try to identify, let's see if it sees uh, Urza, okay. it can of see it, kind of see it. I, I haven't finished the training, but you know what I mean. So I have this thing that is running, but you'll see like, what I found out is that it was, you know, it was kind of a pain to be honest. Um, and it wasn't like super well suited for, um, it was super well suited for identifying cards per se. But it was an interesting thing nonetheless. So what I have done is actually one step further. Um, the and, and just to summarize, and then we'll we'll talk about uh, about the, the next step. What I've done here is what I'm the the principle that I had in mind, and it's and and the thing that you want to play with you and with which you can downloading the the uh, the card database from uh, from Scryfall, which is a site that does. Um, that category that shows um, Magic Gathering card, uh, or we use a, an example card pictures. I split image into training and testing. I run the augmentation. I do transfer learning, and then I package the the model into so that it's compiled to an HTTP. And well, you notice when you do the the uh, the actual um, uh, compiling, you'll notice that uh, basically. That there's multiple operation and there's only one operation that is not running on the TPU. So it, it's actually very efficient at using the, the TensorFlow TPU. And then from there, I'm getting the data from HDFS and like, I'm copying it directly to uh, to my TPU. Again, this would be uh, a bit better. Now, with that said, uh, let me, uh, <laughs> that is true. Let me show you what I have done, and I'm going to try to do this here. Let's see, I'm going to stop sharing here and see if I can share this. Okay. I'm in, I'm in two places at once. Oh, one jam. Yes. Good job. That's, uh, that's a trick, you know, that'll teach you someday. Let's see if I can share my stuff. Hello. Yeah. So that's my personal computer. So that's the next thing I'm working on. Um, and instead of using uh, data augmentation, here what I'm doing is I am using uh, ORB features uh, and uh, and comparing them from the gatherer um, 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 images, which is kind of described for it's, it's just the, the official wizard stuff. And I am comparing them to the features that I that I get from my webcam. The reason why I'm using this is because it's not working on this webcam. So uh, here, 
for now, I'm doing it per set. But if I take a set, for instance, more than mass, uh, more, more than horizon, and I take a picture, what you what you notice is um, if I don't have a glare, this is actually fairly efficient at finding out which card it is. So if I do, I'm trying to show this, and I'm reading it, boom, identify the card automatically. The thing that takes, this is actually very efficient. The thing that takes time, the thing, the most thing that takes time is actually downloading the picture from the internet. Because I, pack, uh, I package the feature so that the, the feature don't hold the image, the, the original, uh, original image itself, right? Um, I can ch check from other sets. For instance, let's say um, a thermal veil drain. Oh yeah, this doesn't work well. This is a work in progress, guys. Uh, but, uh, so thermal veil drain. If I start, you see that like, the problem is glare. Like, I don't know if it's going to be able to properly identify this. Huh, it did. Damn it. Uh, <laughs> but if I, if I move around and so let's say I want a midnight clock and try to get a little bit more glare. Damn it, it's so good. All right, okay, so it, this works great, no problem. <laughs> uh, but what I found out is like a little bit of glare and it, it was a little bit of a pain. Um, so this is, uh, let's see, like, yeah, let's see if I put some glare here. Yeah, you see like that kind of posi like, causing problem. So most likely what we're gonna have to do is, um, you know, find a way to have the proper set of sleeves so that it doesn't reflect as much. Because if I, like, if I remove the sleeve uh, and try to be, to put this in front of the camera, this becomes much easier, right? And you can see the number, like here, you can see the features that are, um, that are matching, right, here. Um, the cool thing about this is that um, I, um, the, the whole set here, like I have four sets here that only has a couple of features and it's taking, it's, it's, uh, it's, Basically, I calculated if I want the whole because there's like there's like twenty thousand cards and five hundred sets with diff with the different printings and etc. So if you want to push that at the edge, what you, you want to avoid to have to call an API to to run your model, right? You want to be able to have it to run directly on the um, um, on the on your Raspberry Pi or whatever it is. Uh, and the the, the problem is. Uh, the, if you have to store too many features, that's going to be problematic, right? Here, we're looking at like max, I think if everything fits completely uncompressed uh, and I didn't do any optimization, it's no more than eight gig on, on, the, uh, on the disk, right? And with some proper, uh, uh, with some proper memory flushing and et cetera, this thing is actually very, very efficient. So yeah, I mean, it, there's also cost, right? Because you don't want to have, like, if you want to do this at scale, we don't want to have too much of it, right? But right now, I got my buddy that, uh, actually, I'm going to stop the share, but so that you have the, I, I can show you the actual thing, if you give me a second. Um, I have a picture of our feeder um, and the thing that we are working on. And what we found out is even with the, um, yeah, even with the feeder here, um, nine times out of like, except for this one card that he sent me just to, uh, to make fun of me, uh, you, this is the feeder that is running behind it. And so even with this, like we, we tested with a, a big set and we are actually able to identify um 95 percent of the time the right card uh and it's lightweight and it's um uh and it doesn't take much memory so that was uh that was kind of an interesting uh, journey the next step is uh obviously it's going to be um you know making it make, make the model more efficient uh probably because right now i'm using just a knn with uh, uh um, uh, on, on those ORB features, uh, very simple, but it seems to be efficient enough. But and then it's going to have to distribute across the fleet of 
of um, of shufflers, right? So that's that will require some some magic. What's probably going to have to happen is um, you can probably we're probably going to have to have a base that is uh, like a, a phone application that is going to push to the to the firmware. That's kind of the way that we see it because also you want to be able to navigate through your deck and say, hey, I want this card. Or I want to say like, hey, I want like, give me a new hand with that much land to uh, spare ratio and stuff like this. Um, but you, you know, we thought about like putting a, um, a screen on the uh, on the machine itself, but you'll never get a better screen than what you have on your phone, right? So it's it's probably it's probably gonna work this way. So we're gonna have a bit of a firmware, and then that allows us to push like more models and more key points when there's there's uh there's new sets that are coming up and and so on and so forth so that's kind of my talk i left about um you know 14 for 15 minutes for question i believe um anything that you uh, i, I want to sh show you a few like give you the links to um the different githubs so that you guys can play with all this. The original, I actually probably should switch. Uh, or you guys still hear me? We can hear you. I don't know which one it is, but it's one of Okay. Okay. Um, so the first one, and this is the work of um, Jan, is going to be, um, so I'm gonna stop sharing. By the way, it, it, I, I'm having a hard time like being in two places at once. The the first GitHub that you want to look at is this one. So this is the original from uh, from Jan that is looking at doing object detection. But I've, oh, and and it's good for this particular uh, type of work. But it wasn't very good for, for in 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 my in my case. The second one that. Uh, the, the the one that I based my ORB model on is from. Uh, I'm gonna try to find this link. Uh, there's a, there's a guy that actually built uh, uh, his or their their thesis on um, on the discard reader. So that's what it did, uh, uh, and I. I'm in the process of making it a lot more efficient. Um, then, because the, you, you'll see, it does a bunch of stuff that are like is basically loading the whole set with the images in memory, and it doesn't save the feature and etc. So I have a secret like um, uh, GitHub that I haven't exposed yet because it's not ready. But I have a private GitHub on on how I augmented this particular work. Uh, but if you're interested, that's that's a lot of work. And if you're interested of stuff that don't work, uh, you can look at uh, card identification. I want to show you the one that is like uh, this just doesn't work at all. Um, is the is the one with the um, the tesseract? Um, I think it's this. Yeah, no, it's the one. Uh, the this GitHub created a um, uh, an MTG dictionary for Tesseract, and this is the one that, even using the example that are in the GitHub, just doesn't <laughs> doesn't work at all. You show them any card, and always defers to uh, to telling you that it's an island. Anyway, that's fun. That's the end of my talk. If you have, you know, I'm going to leave a little bit of time for questions. If you just want some some uh, feedback or uh, want to ask me um, more, just feel free to do so. You can put it in the chat. Or Tim, if you have comments. <laughs> comments from Tim. Yeah, I, I wanted to mention your meetup coming October 15th. Right. You got uh, more time to go deep into discussions on that and if uh maybe people can put their card up to the uh up to the screen and you can scan it yeah so i what i'm uh, what i'm hoping is that by the time i'm going to the meetup uh i will have it running on my raspberry pi 
uh, the the stuff. So like I, this is a quick Qt interface that is garbage, but I don't want to spend time on this. Um, what I want is it's probably it would probably be cool if people can take a picture of their cards and upload them to a bucket that could make public, and then I'll just push that back to the to my Raspberry Pi, and that would be um, that would be a way to see if it works or not. So that we can not prepare it. Actually, that, actually, that sounds like fun. Um, but like this, we'll 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 try it in real time and see uh, and see if it works or not. But yeah, public uploadable uh, S3 though. Sorry, public S3 that you can upload to. Yeah, fine. <laughs> uh, maybe they put. I it mean, that, can we just share like people like you know people have. Uh, webcams they can just do this and i'll do a screenshot on the on the yeah. on the on the meetup so well yeah, andre probably. added something to the edge jai demo where yeah. he spins it up and you could open the web page publicly for a little while maybe you could add an upload screen to that upload the image and then shut that port down and meet wow well, you're cloud guy spin up a a, a tiny web server with upload for like ten minutes and then shut it down. Yeah, I could, I could, I could pro probably do that. Um, but anyway, that was a fun endeavor for for sure. Uh, the, uh, I mean, I, I did learn quite a bit. Like mostly, I learned that uh, I, you, you need to find the right model for the thing that you're trying to do. Um, I think that there's a lot of advantage. Like the disadvantage of using like feature comparison is that. You basically need to build a feature for every one, uh, and it's it's a um, like I get it works better because it's a you know fixed set of images, right? But when you're looking at stuff like that in real life, of like identifying people and and things like this, like you you don't have a finite set of these are the different type of images. Um, so anyway, I learned a lot during this, uh, and you know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, relatively happy with the result because, like, like as you saw, like the the actual identification when it's working, it's 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 fairly efficient, right? It's, just like it, it's it's decent results and fast. Yeah, I mean, in the most time that it spends, it's like just um, basically uh, um, just downloading the image from the internet, which is which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. So, um, prepare to memorize the query for total random task. Okay, came across the time for the simulated data set. Must it be for it to work? Um, yes, it's a good question. Uh, again, this is why we, um, you can, you can have, uh, um, so Michael, you can have multiple, um, classifications, right? Um, it's a matter of how you classify those images, right? Um, the, uh, the, there's two factors, there's this and the amount of data that you have, which is why I'm doing data augmentation. You'll, you'll look at the, the logo TL from, um, from Jan and, and basically um, they, can be, they can be fairly similar, but the more similar they are, the more images you're going to need to be able to differentiate them and to train your, your transfer learning model. That's basically the way that they can think about it, right? Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so I don't know how much time we have allotted, but I believe um, we uh, this session closes at to 55, I want to say. Um, again, like feel free to leave comments, the, the, the stuff in uh, on, the, on my GitHub and etc. I'll be happy to indulge in more nerdery if needed. Uh, okay. Cool. All right. Well, I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. You know. Like I said, uh, oh yeah, one last thing. Like the maybe I can give you the uh, the the meetup invite where I um, we're gonna go a little bit even deeper into it, um, and we'll 
we'll talk about it. Uh, if you guys want to join, obviously it's a Philly meetup, but uh, I heard there was a some sort of a pandemic going on in the world and we're not supposed to talk to each other face to face. So we decided to do it remote. So if you want to join us, basically anybody can join us as long as it's not too terrible of a um, of a time of a time zone. On this, thanks again, everybody, and uh, I will, you know, talk to you later.